drunk. How can I be drunk at 8.30 in the morning? You were the one knocking back the Chianti last night. You did everything but suck the corks. Three glasses, and they were small ones. Welcome to episode two of the Jonathan Creek podcast, where we are often to be found drunk at 8.30 in the morning, and plenty of corks have been sucked. It certainly makes the work day go faster. Or slower. Depending whether you're the one doing the sucking, I suppose. Depending if you can remember or not. <laughs> How are you? I'm not too bad, Jerry. How are you? I'm brilliant. Love this episode. It's a good one. Jack in the Box. It's classic Creek, isn't it? Classic murder mystery. The locked room mystery. Absolutely. Did you know that there's an actual Jonathan Creek body of water? No, I didn't know that. Oh, there you go. Where is it? Kentucky. Right. Should this not have been left for the trivia section at the end? Have you shot your bolt in already? Well, it's at the top of my notes, so I'm seeing it now. Okay. I can't operate in a non-linear fashion. Did you do a Google Images search or a Google Maps to see it? Yes, I did a map search. It's, yeah, next to a lake. Does it look mysterious? It certainly does. Dishevelled? Overgrown? Could do with a haircut? I would say those things all apply. There's some green around it. Huh? Okay. How's your week been? It's been quite good. Yeah. I've been in good spirits, I would say. It's springtime. Getting there. Yeah, it's the last season that I have before the hay fever kicks in. Ah, uh, you're quite a bad sufferer. Usually. Last year wasn't too bad, so hopefully. <laughs> Maybe I've grown out of it at the age of 35 and whatever I am. Unlikely, but listen, I'm sure the listeners aren't here to hear about your medical ailments. I suspect they've already fast forwarded this bit, so don't worry. I would have. <laughs> That'll skip forward 45 seconds. There we go. So, will we begin this week's podcast proper? Sure, why not? What way do you want to begin the podcast proper? I was thinking of something different. What's that? A summary. Okay. Crack on. In Jack in the Box, Jack Holiday, a once popular slapstick comedian, laments the passage of time as his comedy has become less relevant and his health has deteriorated to the extent that his hands are crippled by arthritis. When Jack appears to commit suicide, Maddie and Jonathan investigate the circumstances and discover an apparent contradiction. The victim couldn't have shot himself, but no killer could have escaped the nuclear shelter where the body was found. The intrigue continues when Jonathan is violently threatened, but can he square this circle, or will hopes of a plausible explanation be flushed away? Thank you for that, Ian. We begin this week with a cold open. We do. No credits immediately. We're at the home of Jack Holiday. Well, we're not really, do we? Given these teases at the start, don't we? Okay, what happens? It's, we're in an advert, essentially, for bananas. And it's not made clear that this isn't the episode until it pulls back to show Jack in his living room. Can you tell me about this advert we're watching and the oh, character in it? Terrible. Tonga bananas. It's, it's a very dated sort of ad, or even for 1997, I think it would be viewed as dated. It's sort of Norman Wisdom style slapstick shenanigans. Yeah, it's worse than Norman Wisdom, I think. it's. Uh, I want to use the word obnoxious here. Yeah. He's not a... You're just, you see this character and you, you immediately know what he's like. Well, he's, you, he's you know what his character's like to start with, and then when we see him talking about this advert, it's even worse. What happens in the advert? Well, in the advert, he's basically having fun with a banana, or he's, he's, in fact, he's struggling with a banana. Uh, he and this uh, attractive blonde, apparently, walking through the park. Apparently? She's apparently walking through the park. Okay. And the banana skin gets involved, people fall over, people get stuck in deck chairs. It's all a bit silly. It's slapstick, but at a very base level. Don't get me wrong, I love a bit of old school physical uh, comedy. Yeah. So, Laurel and Hardy, for example, I think are geniuses. Okay. Uh, even in Sledgehammer podcast, I loved David Rashi and his, I think we both did, watched him uh, be a buffoon and, and fall around. But this is just, it's so dated. It's its not original. It's Fortunately, that's also what the show is saying about it. Precisely. Anyway, as we mentioned, or you mentioned earlier, we pull back and we see that Jack Holiday, the star of the advert, is watching a cut of it with someone from the production company. It's a guy called Scott Reisner, I think he must be a producer or something along those lines. Jack's not happy that his old school sense of comedy is apparently no longer acceptable. He's also unhappy that he's been 
in his view, mostly edited out of the advert. Mm. Barely appears and it only has a couple of close-ups. It's PC gone mad. <laughs> and the funniest sight gag has been cut because it's not PC. And Scott explains, obviously, that parking a bike between a girl's buttocks would no longer be acceptable. Why that was ever acceptable and why Jack thinks that would be funny? Ah, oh, dearie me. Jack further explains that he doesn't like the loss of realism. <laughs> The loss of realism when a bike skids on a banana because that wouldn't happen. Well, Jonathan proves that later on, I think. Yeah, Scott explains, obviously, it's subverting the, the humour and some of the tropes. Reisner leaves, and after he does, we see Jack struggle to pour a drink due to his very arthritic hands. And then the credits appear over a shot showing Jack's house, which is perched on a cliffside. Yeah, there's a Rolls Royce pulling up as Scott leaves. Jack Holiday was played by John Blithel, born in 1929. You might be surprised with this, Ian. He has been in The Fifth Element, Dark City, Hail Caesar, The Vicar of Dibley, Two Nine, and one that's probably in line with his character. Never mind the quality, feel the width. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I'm not surprised by all of that, obviously have watched Vicar of Dibley mm -hmm. and he's quite a prominent character in that. I think Frank Pickle is the character. He's one of the... So did you recognise him? Yeah. Well, okay. Primarily from Vicar of Dibley. Uh, Hail Caesar, you're right. I, I like Hail Caesar. It's a good movie. Can and you remember him in that? He's a professor of some kind, I believe. Okay. I, I don't really remember what he says or does. <laughs> I've only seen it once, but I really enjoyed that film. Back to the cliffside. You mentioned as Scott leaves... A Rolls Royce appears and it stops beside Scott for a moment. It does. Who's in the car? It's being driven by a chauffeur slash helper man Butler named type. Oliver. Yeah. I don't think he gets a surname. Uh, he's obviously of a, a lower social class. And Jack's current wife, Kirsten. His second wife, yes. Who is told by Scott that she should ask Jack when she gets back in how things went and it's clear that they didn't go well. Yeah, I think Scott's of the view that the, the client, presumably the banana company, will not be that happy with the ad anyway. Inside Jack's house, Kirsten enters to find a drunk and distraught holiday, and she has more bad news for him. Yes, the man who was convicted for the murder of Jack's first wife is being released from prison the next day. Yes, a Mr Alan Rocksmith. He served nine years. He has. Not long for murder. No, we find out why at the press conference. And sitting next to him is his sister Rachel and Maddie who has been supporting his cause. I want to thank my sister Rachel, who never for one second doubted my innocence. And everyone who's campaigned for my relief, Miss McGillan in particular, for bringing this whole case back to national attention. Yes, I think it's worth remembering, if there was a death penalty in this country, Alan Rokesmith would have hanged. And if he had been hanged nine years ago, I think it's safe to say he wouldn't look too good in these photos today. Such was the media's obsession with the murder of Jennifer Holliday, that Mr Rokesmith here was virtually tried, convicted and sentenced by the tabloid press, who, as usual, prove themselves to be as inaccurate as they are illiterate. Can you spell that, please? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I find it hard to credit that even as we arrived today, this cheque was pressed into my hand for £150,000 to be divided between us for my brother's story. This, from the very people who helped to put him away. Do you think any of us is interested in money? Money can't restore nine years of a man's life. All I ask now is the peace and privacy to go away and rebuild my self-respect. Maddie's face was a picture as she watched that cheque being ripped up. Yeah, certainly a little bit distraught, I think. She rails against the tabloid press but would be happy to take their money. She also rails against the death penalty, which we don't have in this country and have not had for quite some time. Yes, even 20 years ago, it had been a number of decades since the death penalty was uh, in existence. So I'm yeah. not sure what, she, what point she was trying to make. I mean, I, I tried to look into it a little bit. There were a lot of miscarriages of justice resolved in the 90s. People were getting mm. released. I mean, I think some of the 
the more famous ones started coming out in the 90s uh, and even just after this episode in 1998 Derek Bentley who obviously was executed was exonerated so there's obviously it's maybe been a hot topic and that's why it's come up it seems a bit weird now because it's not I mean death penalty isn't something that's really part of the political conversation mm -hmm. it hasn't been Derek Bentley have you seen Let Him Have It? I have. With Christopher Eccleston, yes. one of the doctors, one I believe. Of, I think pretty much everyone in this episode has been in Doctor Who as well. We'll get to that. From the press conference we head to the Rokesmith family home and all three return to this terraced house where his elderly mother welcomes him back with a tear and a hug. Was it just me or did the exterior of that house look like it was still stuck in the 1980s as well from when he went to prison yeah it's kind of grismal wasn't it mm. um anyway he greeted his mother so obviously he was she would have been happy to have survived to see him released and over dinner he outlines his plans for the near future which include renting a remote cottage in wales and a boat yeah he says that the nine years let him do a lot of thinking about guilt and innocence we're in the car. It's about two weeks later, I That's think. exactly what I've written down, yeah. <laughs> Oliver is driving Kirsten to the house and is bemoaning what has become of Jack recently. And he mentions the painful time when he had to break the devastating news of his first wife to him. Yes, he does. He's not wanting to live through that sort of thing again. And he's got this sort of notion that Jack's blaming himself generally for things. At the house, Jack is nowhere to be found and Kirsten is distressed and thinks something must have happened. She peers over the cliffs and looks down. Ominously. Yeah. We're at the house later. It's a wee bit of a skip, I think. They don't wait for the police, they just show up. They can't find Jack anywhere but there's a dog that leads them to the door of a nuclear shelter. Mm. Which has been locked from the inside. So they crowbar this open and walk down a number of stairs and they reach uh, another steel door which they have to cut open with some sort of, is it a propane well, blowtorch? I think or? there's another wait for the fire brigade to show up with the appropriate tools. Um, so we skip forward to that and the fire brigade are there cutting through this metal door. Inside, what do they find? Well, first of all they find some bits and pieces as a toilet and some supplies and then in the next room they find Jack's dead body with a gun clutched in his right hand. Yes, he's on his front and we see blood seep from the side of his head. Fortunately, the policeman there is quite intuitive and solves the case immediately. What does he say? He says there's no doubt that this was self-inflicted. But Kirsten is insistent that this would have been impossible due to Jack's crippling arthritis. Yeah, but the, the policeman doesn't think that anyone could have killed Jack and then left. Meanwhile, at the windmill... Mm -hmm. We have some Asian music playing as Jonathan works on a trick with some matches. Yes, yeah, it's just one of those standard trick match boxes where the matches come out one side and it comes out empty on the other. Before he answers the phone to Maddie. Well, we assume it's Maddie. We do, yeah. Could have, yeah, I suppose it could have been someone else. It could have been anybody. He tells her that he's not been up to much as Adam has a disease of the inner ear. I think we talked about this in the previous episode where they cut Adam's scenes from the rest of series one due to budgetary reasons or they didn't film them due to budgetary reasons so slipping in that he's got labyrinthitis <laughs> he walked on stage and fell in the orchestra pit and had to be carried to the ambulance on a xylophone <laughs> it's just as good a way to deal with it as any i suppose he is then invited to meet with maddie and he literally looks at his diary before keenly accepting yeah he seems quite pleased to have heard from her so we're outside Maddie's place the next day, Jonathan arrives and he times himself doing what? He sees a clamp on the wheel of a car, I don't know if he recognises it as Maddie's car. I think he does. Okay, and he picks the lock essentially on the padlock. Yes, I think he's just doing it to test his own skill level. Well it looks like a fairly basic padlock but he looks quite pleased with himself when he gets it off. Yeah, as he's doing this Maddie appears and has news relating to Trevor's underpants. She's burned them. Quite right. As some kind of liberation, I guess. She then invites Jonathan on a trip to the seaside. I think she suggests that she has to burn some carbon monoxide fumes or dioxide fumes from the car's engine. Yeah. Jonathan is quite surprised to learn that she put the clamp on her own car. 
Yes, well he says that uh, he would like to go on this trip, but he'll have to reclamp it. He was only doing it for you know, scientific purposes. And uh, she says that she was impressed by how quickly he managed it because it sometimes took her just as long with the key and then tells him to throw it back into her boot. Yeah, that's her way of avoiding the parking charges in London. So we're in the car and Jonathan admits that he nearly called her a few times but stopped for fear of getting sucked into one of her murder mysteries. It's just a line, he doesn't actually mean that at this stage. I think he's just trying to clumsily explain that he wanted to call. But yeah, perhaps too shy, not confident enough. Yeah, it's back in the days before you could just text or snapchat. Will we get an example of the technology shortly? Yeah. So she laughs at this suggestion of a murder mystery and he immediately understands that that is exactly why he's in the car. He's not displeased. No. He wants to stop, turn around, go back and she asks him to hear her out as she outlines the case to a less than amused or sympathetic Jonathan. You know Jack Holliday shot himself last week? Yeah, it's the only thing he's ever done that made me laugh. Oh great, the poor man's dead. Well, I don't suppose that'll stop him overacting. One of his many homes down the south coast where he'd had some sort of nuclear bunker put in around the time of Afghanistan. No suicide note, but he was obviously depressed. Yeah, due to the fact that the guy who strangled his first wife has just been released from prison with your assistance. Alan Rokesmith didn't strangle Jennifer Holliday. He was the victim of a squalid miscarriage of justice. As I remember it, he was found leaning over the corpse in an alleyway with a length of nylon cord in his hand. Exactly! And that flimsy evidence, they put him away. Right, look, a brief history lesson. The night Holiday's wife is murdered, Rokesmith is in the next street discussing business with a prostitute. They both hear a scream. Rokesmith runs round to see what's happened. The young slapper pops it. Rokesmith is no sooner at the body and is untying a rope from around her neck when the coppers arrive on the scene to nick him. Circumstantial evidence he's put away for a crime he didn't commit. It's taken his sister the best part of five years to find that prostitute and get her to come forward. She showed me the evidence and I just kept pestering and publicising till the Home Office finally saw sense and granted a reprieve. All right. Can I ask where all this is needed? The glove compartment. Seems as good a destination as any. Mm -hmm. What does Jonathan find in the glove compartment? A letter. From whom? It's a letter from Kirsten Rogers, the second wife of Jack Holiday, to Maddie. Essentially explaining to her just how much she hates her and blames her for this. She's called a meddling, misleading liberal cow. Seems fair. I'd say so. And accusing Rokesmith of killing Jack. Yeah, that would make sense. You understand why she would think that. The timing. So Maddie wants Jonathan to prove that Jack killed himself. And he, at this point, demands that she stops the car and he gets out in the middle of nowhere. Well, before he does that, there's a very British reference that a lot of viewers maybe missed. Okay. So the last word of the letter is hell. Mm -hmm. And then she signs it Kirsten Rogers. But Jonathan can't read the handwriting very well and thinks it says Hull Kingston Rovers, which is an English rugby league team. Yeah. Uh, so folk who don't know that, <laughs> that'll maybe just go over their heads a little bit. But that's what the joke is. After Jonathan gets out of the car. Yeah, we cut to him back in the car. <laughs> I think it's quite apparent he's considered his options. And he's asking where do they begin? So she explains that she has already spoke to Kirsten, who is interested in Jonathan's opinion, and she drops him off at the house. Obviously can't go in herself. No, she's in the bad books. So at the house, inside, Jonathan feigns interest and respect for Jack as Kirsten shows off some of his memorabilia. Yeah, he's got um, basically a gallery to himself inside his own home. Mm -hmm. The outfit he wore in a particular movie and scripts that he's written on. Yeah. We find out about the creepy age difference between Jack and his first wife. Now, this, it's not just the fact that there's an age difference, that's not unusual, especially you know between celebrities, but describe why it's creepy. Well, he proposed to her when she was seven. Mm. He went to America for 15 years and kept his promise when he came back. That's, they make it sound romantic, but it's, it's just not, disgusting. Yeah, it's not good at all. So she would be 22 at that point. Yeah. And he would be presumably in his 50s. Yeah. None of this is good. No. Even the idea of proposing when she was seven, that's just weird. Yeah, let's move on. Still, Kirsten explains there wasn't a happier marriage in show business. 
until he started getting death threats. So yeah, it's fine up to the point that Foe wanted to kill him. We also find out about his nervous disposition and the night his wife was murdered. We do. He was in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. conveniently, and told her to take care, be very careful. And she didn't. She went down a back alley and got murdered. Fair enough. Yeah. Had it coming, essentially. She would listen to him, they'd be fine. Yeah. Kirsten explains that she and Jack then found love through the grief. Yeah. Jack's just a... Yeah. An arse. <laughs> For lack of a better term. Yeah. Manipulator, potentially. No one arse. Okay. She then emphasises his arthritis and states that this is how she knows that he could not have pulled the trigger. Yeah, conclusively. Mm -hmm. And she asks, or she's going to ask Oliver to take Jonathan down to where the suicide slash murder took place because she can't go. And she tells Jonathan that she'd be very grateful for any insight that he could provide. Assuming, of course, that it is in align with what she thinks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Kirsten Holiday was played by Maureen O'Brien, born in 1943. She was in 38 episodes of Doctor Who playing Vicky opposite William Hartnell. Did you know that already? No, I've not watched the old Doctor Who's. So he was the first Doctor? Yeah. I've not watched any of them, but I know yeah. who he is. Black and white one. Yeah. She was also in The Legend of King Arthur, Casualty, Doctors, Heartbeat, The Bill, Cracker and Taggart. Yeah. I think there's a, a list the BBC has somewhere. And if it needs anybody for Casualty or Doctors or Doctor Who, it just brings them in. And I'm pretty sure the folk who made the bill got hold of that list at some point in the <laughs> 90s. We get a kind of cutaway to an architect's office where Maddie is showing off the plans for the nuclear bunker and trying to look it for flaws. Yeah, it is confirmed that it would have been impossible for anyone to get in or out any other way. Yeah, there's a 50 centimetre thick concrete shell essentially around the bunker and even a nuclear bomb couldn't disrupt it, although a blowtorch gets you through the door. Yeah, that's the only weak point. Yeah, so stay away from the door. If there's a nuclear bomb, don't let it land near the door and you're fine. This uh, bunker and shell was encased by cliffside, by rock. From the office we head over to the bunker and Jonathan is looking around. What does he note? Well, there's a few things. So he, he learns it was built in the late 80s and wasn't finished because the toilet's not installed, there's doors missing, and he kind of stamps the floor and thumps the walls. He's trying to feel for weak spots. He has a toilet pipe there, so the plumbing may be in, but the toilet wasn't attached to it. And he sees a bit of cotton wool on the floor. In addition to that, he notices that there's, well, there's lots of boxes of light bulbs, and he picks one up and notices that there is a 100 watt bulb in a 40 watt box. He does notice that. I think he also notes that it's, the toilet was quite fancy. It wasn't a run-of-the-mill basic thing. Back up to the house. Jonathan gives Kirsten some bad news. He doesn't think that anyone else could have been involved. Yeah, she's got some theories that wouldn't stand up and he dismisses them. He doesn't think anyone left. So, back to the car. Yeah, and Jonathan's getting upset with Maddie. This is obviously the days before harsh new mobile telephone laws came in. So Maddie's driving along listening to her voicemail. Trying to. Oh yeah, she's not got a great signal. She explains to Jonathan that his agitating is making it difficult for her to drive <laughs> and it's him that's causing the problem. She receives a voicemail, but I thought this was quite quaint. She couldn't even redial from the voicemail. She asked Jonathan to get the number, so yeah. the technology wasn't there to, to call back a call that came in. And importantly, the, call, the message also wasn't date stamped or time stamped so you don't know when it was left. Correct. She is in fine spirits because she thinks that she's in the clear. Yeah, the murder theory's been disproved but Jonathan kind of hums to himself and keeps thinking. Yeah, something doesn't quite square with him and it's something that he's seen but can't... Yeah, he can't quite put his finger bit on it. nebulous. But they're also trying to match up this report of Jack being unable to use his hands with the banana ad. Mm-hmm where he uses his hands. So, Maddie heads over to Image Productions to speak to Scott. And what does she find out there? Well, first of all, we find out that she called him after midnight the night before to <laughs> arrange this appointment. They watch back the ad and it just turns out that all the work involving hands was done with doubles, a guy with his arms through, under the arms of... Yeah, Jack, Jack. needed a stuntman just to peel a banana. 
He said he was all rusted up like walking rigor mortis. So there was no way he could have turned a key in a heavy door, loaded a gun and then pulled the trigger. Well, unless there was a miracle, I think Scott says, in the last two days of his life. Colin Stinton played Scott Riser. He was born in 1947. You may have seen him in The Bourne Ultimatum, Rush, Veep, Doctor Who, Waking the Dead, or A Bit of Fry and Laurie. Okay, that's popular. I would have seen him in Rush. I don't remember him, but I like that movie. That's uh, Nicky Lauder and, uh, what do you call him? James Hunt. Yes. It's probably uh, Chris Hemsworth and Daniel Brühl, who's really very good and everything. Yeah, not seen it myself. Yeah. From Image Productions, we next go to the Welsh cottage that Rokesmith rented. Yes, his sisters arrived to spend some time with him. But there's no sign of him. And his diary has not been completed and she naturally looks concerned. It's a bit of clumsy direction, not that I'm going to tell... Is it Marcus Mortimer again in this mm-hmm. one? How to do his job, but you see her seeing this and then the camera doubles back to show you, oh, look what date it was that he didn't finish his diary entry. Yeah, treats the viewer a little bit um, simply, I would say. Just then, two cops arrive with bad news. With fortuitous timing as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they found the boat and it's wrecked. So we head over to Rokesmith's terraced house. Yes, I presume Rachel's returned home and Maddie's there. Talking about Alan's death at sea, or apparent death at yeah, sea. Yeah, Rachel updates her and explains that the diary finished on the, the Thursday morning and Maddie tells her about the voicemail she received from him. Yeah, and letters are there. Yes. Rachel then gives Maddie a box of letters that Rocksmith had with him in prison and talks about an order he was placing or had placed for Fudge. Which she also notes he hated. Now... What if he hadn't hated Fudge? Yeah, and why, if you're using this... Well, we don't want to spoil anything just now, but if you didn't like Fudge, you could have chose just about anything else to have a discussion about. Yeah. Now, one possibility is that he knew his sister would immediately recognise this as something erroneous. Mm. That she would know he hated Fudge and therefore investigate further. But that the implies that he would want someone to know... I don't know anyone who hates Fudge. Well, nobody hates fudge. No, I mean, it might, not, might not be your favourite, but no one hates it. No one detests it. It's like saying people hate football. Silly. It's absurd. In any case, this revelation apparently piques Maddie's interest. Of course. Rachel Rokesmith was played by June Watson. She starred in 102 Dalmatians, Highlander Endgame, Agatha Raisin, Hobie City, William and Mary, Casualty. <laughs> The War of the Roses and the Zed Cars. And we continue with our Doctor Who connection. Apparently she was cast to play Lady Eleanor in Doctor Who, the Time Warrior, but had to pull out. There's another Zed Cars connection. I think one of the other actors in this episode's a, a Zed Cars veteran. It seems to be the, they were all just chums. It's quite convenient. They do a good job though in this episode. They do. Meanwhile, over at the windmill. Jonathan receives a call from Maddie who briefs him on what she's discovered and admits that she is starting to have doubts as a lot of things don't make sense. He scoffs dramatically at the wrecked boat with no body. Uh, He thinks that's a bit of a cliche, I believe. I would agree. Fortunately, for the sake of this story, the story knows it's a cliche and that's not something that we need to worry about. Over to the cliffside. Well, before we go over to the cliffside, you you mentioned Maddie's list of concerns. Did you notice she'd literally written down her list of concerns? Yes. (laughs) For the stupid viewers who couldn't work out what was going on. Was it actually entitled List of Concerns? (laughs) Things that don't add up or something along those lines. Potential clues. (laughs) Remember these things. Key points to the episode. The cliffside. Yeah, they're, they're obviously out on a walk. And Maddie works on a theory based on what they know, but Jonathan is more interested in the fudge letters. Holiday locked himself in the bunker using some sort of lever or, or, or a device that he could operate with his crippled hands. Which he then dropped down the hole where the loo was going to go. He had some special tool that enabled him to pull the trigger. Like an arthritic suicide aid. Which was on elastic. So that when he collapsed, it also disappeared down the hole, making it look like a suicide that wasn't quite convincing enough to really be suicide. Amazing. Yes? Why? 
sorry? Why did he do that rather eccentric thing you've just described as opposed to shooting himself in the sitting room? Mm. Those letters of Roke Smith's, can I have another quick squint? All they say is thank you for ordering our quality fudge, stuff like that. We have had some difficulty acquiring supplies. Well, maybe it's me, but I just thought it was odd that he keeps something like that from nine years ago. Postmarks are all from around the time he was first arrested. I mean, fudge, which according to his sister, he absolutely detested even as a boy. That is odd. One for your lateral brain. Hmm. We talked last week about how the creator, David Rennick, envisioned Jonathan Creek as a British Columbo. Yeah, how he agreed with me. Well, I think he thought of it first. Nope. Anyhow, I think Maddie's theory here might be a sort of subtle hat tip to Columbo because that exact premise was used for a murder in one of the episodes. Which one? Bye bye Sky High IQ murder case. Well, when you say a premise, it wasn't used in the murder. It was suggested by a supposed um, genius as to... Yeah, is it, yeah, it was suggested as a way that the murder could have been committed. Yeah. And as, and as Maddie's doing here. Yes. In any case, Maddie is less than impressed with Jonathan's lack of help. But he does admit he's now convinced that Jack was murdered. Yeah, because she thinks he's given up on that idea. Yeah, but he just can't work out how it was done. Very frustrating. We get a very British change in the weather. Downpour. And <laughs> very inconveniently, Maddie's left her keys back where they were sitting down. <laughs> yeah. At the same time, Jonathan posits his theory that perhaps there was a killer with motive to kill both Jack and his first wife and used Rokesmith as a convenient patsy. Yeah, he made a weird comment. Someone had the motive to kill Jack and Jennifer and set it up with the death threats. Sure, that would just be death threats. If you want to kill someone and send them a death threat, it's just a death threat. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, he suggests that perhaps when Rokesmith was released, that gave him an opportunity to, to knock off Jack with cover. But in this instance, Maddie accepts that as a possible motive, but points out that it still doesn't um, explain how it was carried out. Yeah, I think Jonathan feels like if he cracks the motive, it'll maybe help him towards explaining the crime. He agrees with her and is also niggled by the light bulb and the toilet. Yeah. And as you mentioned, things get worse for them when they realise that the car keys have been left <laughs> a distance away. We next see them in the hotel and it becomes apparent that Maddie has made Jonathan go back for the keys <laughs> that she left. They like, could both completely drink it and they take a separate room, a room each. Drink it? Drink it? Mm -hmm. Wet? Yeah, I know what it is. Not okay. sure anyone else will. 99% of listeners will know what drink it means, especially the context. Okay. So they're eating their dinner and she gives him a history of a rokesmith before he has a breakthrough. Yeah, Alan worked in tele... Was it just me that found it confusing taking these notes with the guy called Alan when the actor that plays Jonathan Creek's called Alan? Just you. I kept on writing Alan and thinking, oh, oh. You'll get used to it. Yeah. Well, if there's no more characters called Alan, we're absolutely fine. <laughs> Yeah, Rokesmith worked in telecommunications and was involved in a few dodgy dealings. He doesn't seem to be the cleanest cut individual. But Jonathan has realised that the content of the letters are irrelevant. It's the envelopes that hold the key. So they head up to his bedroom. Well, before they do, there's a point of view shot, which again, we saw the same sort of thing used in the first episode. Someone was looking through the window at them from the bushes. Yeah, sinisterly. Yeah. So up in his room... They steam off the stamps and discover a series of messages from someone apologising for the situation. Yeah, how many times could you steam off a stamp before it loses its sticky? Once. So... Well, you can maybe re-stick it with some other glue. So, adhesive. Rokesmith's taken the stamp off, right? How's he put the stamp back on without destroying the message? Well, he could use some sort of print stick. Would that not tear up the bit of paper that the message is written on? Mm, don't know. Maybe... I don't know, I, I just assume they, they retained enough of their own natural glue <laughs> for one more stick. The letter writer also promises to stand by Rokesmith. Yeah, did you take a note of what all the messages said? No. Should we just read them? Because it makes sense. Do you have a, a note? I do. 
Okay. So the first one says, I'm so sorry about what has happened. I pray it will yet be resolved somehow. We must try to be patient. That's interesting. When you know what happened, we'll maybe come back to it. Second one, I know things are looking bad right now, but if the truth comes out, it would be the end of everything. Don't give up hope. And the last one, these are dark times. I appreciate your silence and I'll stand by my pledge to you, come what may. Quite Sherlockian. Yeah, they're obscure, not obscure, oblique, is that mm. the right word? They're, yeah, not straightforward messages. Maddie thinks they're potentially evidence of a romantic relationship. Yes, but Jonathan is non-committal. Now, clearly not wishing to leave the room for the night, she hints that she could stay, but he's been, um... He's, he's completely oblivious. She's flirting with him and he's just on this, um, mystery. And she leaves, and as she does, we see him come to his senses and he's annoyed with himself. It's so, the exact same thing that he did at the end of the last episode. Mm -hmm. So opportunities are going by for him. We then get the trope of seeing two people on either side of a, a wall in a hotel. They can't sleep. Thinking about each other and wanting to be with each other apparently. And a weird thing happens. Well, she appears to be sleeping in the nude and she gets up and puts a towel around herself. Yeah. And the next thing we see, somebody comes into Jonathan's room. Mm -hmm. Now, I've seen a couple of folks suggest he assumes it's Maddie and doesn't respond. That doesn't make sense to me because if he thought Maddie was getting in his bed, I think he would react to that. This is why I said it's weird. So if we assume that, okay, so that's one possible scenario. He thinks it's Maddie. He's not asleep. He pretends to be initially, but after a few moments. So if it's not Maddie, this person's come in to do what they're going to do and then left. He's not a asleep. He'd be aware of that. Yeah, maybe he thinks he's dreaming. Nah. Or maybe he is asleep, he just doesn't appear to be asleep. Or maybe it was Maddie, who then got back out. I don't uh, think that happened. Okay. What happens in the morning? He wakes to find a melon on the pillow next to him, a watermelon, with a knife in it. Yes. So he calls her room and she wakes to answer this th th this call. I think that's a part of the clip we heard at the top of the podcast. Yeah, she says it's nothing to do with her. And he looks at the note with the watermelon, which is ca <laughs> cunningly placed to what? appear... Uh, expl expl like an expletive. Yes, we can only see CK off and the melon is lifted to reveal... Back off. <laughs> Maddie suggests it's because they're getting too close to something. Yeah, but Jonathan's not really hearing her because he's put his head out the door and he's seen a toilet at the end of the corridor and that's caught his attention. Yeah, and something clicks into place in his mind. Yeah, and he decides to leave. Yeah, he's not for hanging around. I think he values his life too highly. Yeah, he explains he's got a train to catch, but she will not let him leave until he explains what he's figured out. So, they head back up to Jack's house, and they arrive to be greeted by a gruff Oliver, just before Kirsten appears. Yep, she's pleased to see Jonathan at first, but when he, she realises that Maddie's there, she's much less welcoming. Yes. She assumes that they're there to confirm that murder was impossible. However, there is obviously something up, and Jonathan wants to go down to the shelter for a small experiment. Before we do, Oliver was played by Bernard Kay. He died in 2014, aged 86. He himself appeared in 19 episodes of Doctor Who between 1964 and 71. He was also in Doctor Zhivago, Witchfinder General, Vincent Price movie, Trog, Doctor's Casualty, <laughs> Coronation Street, Emmerdale Farm, Scarf Jack, Dick Barton Special Agent and Zed Cars. He was also, I heard, Aslan in the 1960s version of The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Correct. He's been in a ton of things, so if you go through his list of credits, that would take you about a week. Down to the shelter. We see Jonathan replace one of the light, or swap one of the light bulbs out. Yeah, we assume it's maybe the one that he saw. Before summarising the initial conundrum that he was faced with, but saying that they should not confuse the implausible with the impossible whatever remains and all that they then go on to consider the whole thing from a new angle well he explains that what he does for a living relies on the implausible but if you haven't seen the first one they don't really talk about what he does for a living in this episode yeah i think they're assuming that people will have watched it yeah he has some shocking news the person with motive to kill jack's first wife was who it was jack himself 
And although he was in the USA at the time, he could have and indeed did hire someone to do it. Yeah, Kirsten objects, but they talk over her essentially and explain what happened. Yeah, we then get a flashback to a gloved person forcing Jack into the shelter and shooting him. But now came the problem. The gun was put in his hand to suggest suicide. A hand we all know was physically incapable of squeezing the trigger. Leading us to the simple conclusion that the killer was someone who didn't know about Jack's arthritis. You were right. I was wrong. I believed in Alan Rokesmith. His sister did. We all did. I'm only just beginning to see how I did it. From behind bars, manipulated, paid off witnesses, paid that prostitute to say she'd been with him, literally bought his way out of there. You haven't anything to connect Jack with that evil man. He'd kept these, Mrs. Holliday. I don't think you'll argue that's your husband's handwriting, even in capitals. The Greek E's and tails on the R's are all over that script you showed me in the cabinet upstairs. At first, we thought they were from a secret lover. If the truth came out, it would be the end of everything. He was telling Rokesmith to keep his mouth shut, in exchange for which he'd stand by his pledge to make sure the money came through as they'd arranged. This is some sort of malicious hoax. And it's time I call the police. Mo, Kirsten. So at this point, Oliver steps in and explains that Jack confessed all to him at some stage when he was drunk. And he didn't want the memories that Jack left the nation to be tarnished. Yes. He describes his first marriage as a bit of a shambles but said that divorce would have you know, cost him a fortune, so it was never on the cards. Yeah, he admits that leaving the knife in the melon was a bit childish. <laughs> Melodramatic, maybe. And at this point, Creek explains what happened to Roke Smith after the murder. Yes. So what did happen? Well, he took down the end wall of the lavatory in advance mm -hmm. and rebuilt most of it. Uh, nearer or a wee bit out from the wall so there's a gap behind it um, he didn't want his mother and sister to know they think about this so he thought he would just fake his death in the boating accident but what in fact happened was he climbed into that gap uh, having taken a lethal concoction of pills bricked it up from the inside and waited there to die presumably Maddie says possibly the most ridiculous line in the entire episode at this point looking back it was all there in his eyes yeah, I think it's a bit of wishful thinking. So how did the toilet help Jonathan find this or discover this? Okay, so the outlet pipe for the toilet was too near the wall for the cistern that he saw sitting outside to fit in where it would have had to go on that particular Yeah, moment. because the wall was, was pulled out yeah. to create this cavity, so it wouldn't have fitted. The bulb switch was also explained so you couldn't see any sort of imperfections in the work and the fact that the maybe the mortar work was new. Kirsten is not convinced fully as yet so they've got one way of proving it yeah they get Oliver to drill a hole in the wall and what do they discover? Well, they discover the, the corpse of Alan Rokesmith they seem to have died quite a peaceful death for someone who took a concoction of pills well, I thought it was quite a haunted face you see yeah but he's not vomited or in other ways I thought you'd be quite physically ill if you took a lethal I don't know, I've never done it so I don't know have you not? no but okay. the um, depictions that I've seen elsewhere in fiction me to believe it might be less um, serene. Mm -hmm. Alan Rokesmith was played by Robin Sones, born in 1947. He has starred in Viceroy's House, Victoria, Doctor Who, <laughs> the old one and the new one, right. Doctors, <laughs> Endeavour, Midsummer Murders, Bows and Casualty, Casualty, <laughs> The Bill, <laughs> Pierpoint, okay. Agatha Christie's Marple, Hobie City, Ticking all the boxes, he's on the list. Lovejoy, Bergerac, 
some classics in here. He's got one of those faces that I thought I recognised and I couldn't place it and I've looked through his listings and I don't know. I wonder if it's from watching this episode when I was younger. Maybe. Or I mean that's the trait of a, a good character actor. Yeah. Know the face, don't know the name. A long and varied career that no doubt continues. It does. Where do we have this week's epilogue? It's out on the cliffs near the the house. What's Jonathan trying to do? Well, he's trying to work out whether you can actually slip on a banana skin while Maddie plays with the matchbox trick from earlier. <laughs> he thinks he might try with a run-up. And you see him sliding off and you think, oh, he's proven it. Um, and, and Maddie says, well, that proves it works with dog's mess. <laughs> Let's see if the banana... That's unfortunate and disgusting. Maddie is playing with this uh, this matchbox trick that we saw earlier in the episode, as you mentioned. And it's a sort of metaphor, isn't it? Yeah, for, for what happened. Because Jonathan points out that there's not much mystery to it. Yeah, the what, matches don't leave the box, or they couldn't leave the box, so they must still be in there. They're hidden. Yeah. That's how he was able to work out the, the case of the jack-in-the-box. I think we find out in this scene that the phone message you left for Maddie was also old and not really relevant. It was kind of a red herring earlier on. It was. And there we have it. Yeah, I think it might be, before we wrap up, interesting to go back to those three messages off the envelopes now we know what happened. Go for it. And see if we can kind of figure out what was being said. Mm -hmm. If you've got the time, you're not rushing off. No, no, plenty of time. So, I'm so sorry about what has happened. And start the first one. So, he's sorry that he paid him to kill his wife and he got caught. Yes. So he was hoping they would not get caught. That's normally what happens with hired assassins. I pray it will yet be resolved somehow. That's just nonsense. It's yeah, that's, anything by no, that. that's please don't say anything. Yes. We must try to be patient. That's please be patient. Yes. Please don't say anything. You must try to be patient. <laughs> yes. And then the next one. I know things are looking bad right now. Well, yeah, they're looking bad for Alan. They're not looking bad for Jack. He got what he wanted. <laughs> um... But if the truth comes out, it would be the end of everything. What? For Jack. Yeah. Not for Alan. Alan wouldn't lose anything if the truth came out. Well, he would. He would lose the money that well, he's pledging. But he's in jail, so he can't really do anything with that. Like, apart from pay off witnesses and potentially get himself out on that mm -hmm. basis. And give it to your sister and mother. Yeah, maybe. But then they haven't moved out there. Shambolic Getty's home. No. He says, don't give up hope. Well, easy to say when you're not the one in prison. <laughs> yeah. And the last one says, these are dark times. Not so much for Jack, who's having a successful career <laughs> and making a lot of money. I appreciate your silence and I'll stand by my pledge to you, come what may. So basically saying, you keep shutting up and I'll keep sending the money. The whole series of letters could uh, summarise as, please don't say anything, I'm going to give you cash. So the fact that Alan has kept these letters and the fact that Alan chose fudge that his sister would identify as unusual suggests that he was keeping open the option of dropping Jack in it, I it's think. It's an insurance policy. Yeah. So that's quite interesting. Mm hmm What doesn't really, I suppose, make sense is that if you are going to kill the man, so in this case, Alan's going to kill Jack because of what he's done, why would he not just give him up? Why would he not bring this evidence forward himself? Yeah, let him sit in jail. Because then he's admitting that he did it as well, so he'd go back to jail. He's now out of jail. Yeah, that's true. Unless yeah. he... Said, put the evidence forward and then killed himself. But well, then he would I'm know sure, that Jack got his commands. Okay, but I'm sure you could use that as some sort of plea bargain. If you've done nine years mm. and then say, listen, I can, there is more information here. There is a, a bigger picture. How about we come to a deal? See, I think maybe he started around this road of getting himself off, paying this person to give fake evidence. And he has genuinely had an epiphany where he realises that we were terrible people, we did a terrible thing and we should pay for it. Mm. And that's why he's come to this conclusion. Well, listen, let's chat about that in the episode review. Okay. So, motive. Okay. Revenge and also... Justice. His ju sense of justice. Yeah. See, it's a bit dubious. I mean, he agreed to kill this person for money. Yeah. I think also, in a way, part of the revenge is not for the ordering of the murder. Part of the revenge is for the way that Jack's been able to live scot-free for the last nine years. Yeah, but surely that's... Rokesmith's fault. If I pay you as a hitman and you get yeah. yourself caught, that's because you've been bad at your job. Holiday didn't have anything to do with that. That's you've been not a very good hitman. Yeah, but he's been sitting thinking, stewing over this for nine years, so he's maybe just not come to logical conclusion. Just things that fit in his narrative. We didn't really discuss, did we? You know, is he a? I'm, I keep calling him a hitman. He's not a hitman or assassin. Someone who's been paid. I think he's a general bad guy. A hired a thug, yeah, somewhere. Better work, yeah. Uh, and not very good at the old hitman. Clearly. So the alibi this week, it's an odd one. He's nowhere to be found and it looks like suicide. Well, he appears to have died in his boat as well. The clues. 
I'll go through them if you want, and you can tell me which ones, if any, I have missed. Okay. So the arthritis, the position of the toilet and the, the plumbing, the light bulb, the cotton ball, the fudge letters, and the handwriting. Yeah. I think that was the primary. Well, yes, they're the ones that got... What was the cotton ball proving in the end? Didn't really prove anything, but I think it showed that he used... Um, that was a, a stopper for some pill bottle. Right. And the gotcha. Well, I suppose the gotcha is... They found his body. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's pretty cast iron, isn't it? Yeah. And that's us. Do you have any trivia this weekend? Yeah, did you know that Jonathan Creek is a real body of water? <laughs> I did spend some significant period of time trying to find out where they filmed the exteriors for this episode. Okay, lucky uh, for you, I have something. Okay. So the blonde at the beginning in the advert, the okay. banana advert, was Emma Noble. She was quite big back in the 90s as a TV personality model. She was, on, she was a, a, a game show girl. It rings a bell, the name. She ended up marrying James Major, son of the former Prime Minister, and had a child with him. I think they're divorced now, but yeah, she was part of a um, high-profile couple back then. Now, he was in office until the 2nd of May 1997. Yeah. This episode was broadcast on the 17th. But so certainly it been filmed. when it was filmed, yes, she was the, the daughter-in-law of the Prime Minister. There you go. And if anyone out there knows where the exteriors were filmed, it would be interesting to find that out. We're back in two weeks with episode three, which will look at the reconstituted corpse. That sounds good. In the interim, if you need another podcast to keep you going before that, our Blackadder podcast continues next week. And if you want to talk about this episode of Jonathan Creek or any of the ones that have come before, head over to jonathancreekpodcast.com where there's a post up for each episode. And you can get hold of us on social media. We're at Creek Podcast on both Twitter and Facebook. Mm -hmm. Is that us? I think we've covered all the bases. I think so. Till next week. Cheerio. Bye bye.